Hello everyone, this is Group 3 and our project is about Fitbit, inspiring a healthier, more active lifestyle. Uh, our team members are Brianna, Ariel, and myself, Mantas. So Fitbit was founded uh, by Healthy Metrics Research in March 2007. As Fitbit progressed from 2007 onwards, it launched several new products in the market. It initially started as a wearable fitness tracking device maker, but it has evolved significantly into an integrated wellness platform. It also tracks uh, all your health and well-being into the smartwatch. Starting from clips, smartwatches, it has also evolved into wristbands. Fitbit had its first day trading price. It was made public uh, in June 2015, and its first day trading price was $30.30, a 52% increase over the IPO price. Currently, as we said today, it's untradable. Its last share price was $6.93 before it got acquired by Google in January 2021. So our project is about what happened to Fitbit and what can we help in order to make Fitbit a better company and to survive in the market where today we have a lot of competition in the whole wearable fitness tracking device market. So let's talk about Fitbit's offering. Fitbit has several products to offer, starting from a low range zip to a high-end search, uh, where each product has its own particular uh, characteristics. Depending on the price, you get the functionality. So for example, an onboard GPS or a connected GPS might be available in a high-end model like search, but for people who cannot afford expensive Fitbits, they can always take the zip, which is more of something that uh, helps you collect uh, data about your steps, calories, distance, etc. Before we talk about competition with other activity trackers, Within Fitbit itself, there is a wide variety of products. So there are several points of parities and several points of differences within the Fitbit uh, arena itself. Talking about competition, Fitbit has its competition with several companies and some of the major ones being Apple Watch, Mi 3, Xiaomi, Samsung Gear 2, and Garmin. All of these companies target different audiences, but at the same time, they're all wearable devices and uh, they all track activities and they perform the same function that at one point Fitbit had aimed to do. So the competition has grown. Apple Watch with its brand loyalty, Xiaomi being a cheaper product, Samsung again, a brand loyal product, and Garmin, it's a new product which had gained popularity with Fitbit. The leading competitor is obviously Apple. Given the brand loyalty, when Apple Watch came out, uh, it was well anticipated that Fitbit will have a huge amount of competition. As you see, there are some pros of Fitbit, like uh, the battery life is great, but at the same time, Apple has it in, in its con that it has a poor battery life. The price itself is going to be huge, but because of the brand loyalty, people are willing to pay for an Apple Watch over a Fitbit. Um, so as we see, there are several benefits of having a Fitbit versus an Apple, but Apple eventually did, it, it did overcome its challenges and it's ahead of Fitbit in the market today. So let's explore more about that. The financial situation. Uh, right now, as we see Fitbit, when it started back in 2011, it, there were very minimal devices that they sold. As they went through uh, 2014, it was at its peak before its IPO launch, and then it slowly steadies down. So as we have learned in one of our chapters, such a model as you go to the top, they're, they're reaching its maturity stage, and now they have to make sure that they sustain themselves in the market. Uh, as we compare them along with the other competitors, we see that in 2014 and 2015, Fitbit does have a huge amount of market share. In 2014, it was really huge, but just in one year, they went down from 44% down to 24.3% because of Apple's entry. Fast forward to 2017, the amount of shipments that were happening, again, Apple was leading it. It took the top spot along with the other companies. Fitbit was just a little behind with Apple being at 23%, Fitbit at 20%. Um, again, another metrics that we saw, Apple jumped to the top of the wearable markets. It, uh, the in the top five markets, we have Apple, Xiaomi, Fitbit, Garmin, and Fossil. Fossil was another new entrant that came in. As you see, Fitbit in 2016 was at 22.5 million, and in 2017, it went down to a 15.4 million. So we're seeing a constant decline 
from its peak in 2014 down to 2017. So the challenge that we present is, hey, we already reached our peak. We're going down in our maturity stage. Are we going to slump down and not have as much production again? Or can we repeat the pattern and go to the top again as we reached 2021? Now I'll pass it on to Brianna, who will explain the environmental influences. Yeah, thanks, Montav. So throughout the last few years, Fitbit had some environmental influences that they could not control. So their marketing could not control them, but they did reap some benefits from some of these influences. Some of these influences being the natural environment, economic, and then technological. So natural, this one is obvious, COVID-19. It's affected millions of businesses throughout the entire world. It changed consumer behaviors. It changed health trends. Um, so the wearable sales actually increased for Fitbit. Um, year over year, year sales were actually higher than last year due to some of these health trends from the COVID-19 pandemic. Number two, so some economic trends. So people lost their jobs from the pandemic. People are becoming more frugal. There's a slight economic downturn. And because of these things, people are looking for cheaper options. As Montab talked about earlier in the presentation, Fitbit offers a variety of options, and some of those being cheaper options. Options like Apple only have a really expensive option, so Fitbit did benefit from that as well. Lastly, we have the technological environment. And I wouldn't say this is necessarily the last year, but maybe more so around the last five years per se, right? So there has been an increased appetite for measurements, right? So more accurate measurements and then just the ability to measure more. So this constantly changing technological environment is really making for these different you know, competitors to continuously improve their features in their watches to keep up with what the competition is doing. So these three things kind of account for those environmental influences. And then the next is their current target consumer, right? So with this slide, they have different, um, in a different age range. Um, they are targeting 18 to 40 years of age for their consumer base, right? So you have Ricky on the left and Rachel on the right. Um, Ricky's 23, Rachel's 34. So within that target market. And they're targeting two different types of consumers. So the first one being someone who is already fit and they want to just track those goals and exceed their goals. The second type of person is someone who really wants to begin their fitness journey, but they lack the motivation to do so. So Ricky is a gym teacher. He wants to track his fitness and he wants that device to help him and enable him to track. And then Rachel um, lacks the motivation to do so. She, she would like a device to motivate her to start her fitness journey. And they are doing this targeting based on demographic factors and those factors being age as well as lifestyle. And then they're also doing psychographic targeting. So they're targeting based on lifestyle. So looking to start that fitness journey, um, it's a time point in their life um, where they're looking to be active. And then I don't want to drain the slide, but this is just a simple SWOT analysis to give you an idea of some of the overall strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for Fitbit. So some of the strengths. A strength of Fitbit that we noticed was they are providing both the trackers as well as the smartwatch versions, right? And because they're doing that, the trackers, they offer some type of simplicity. They're user friendly. They're really meant for the users who don't really want to be connected all the time and want that smartwatch. And Apple, they really only offer that smartwatch option. They have a point of differentiation as well um, with stress measurements they, that came out in a recent version of one of their new watches. They have a first mover advantage and they are very targeted with their approach. So they are very focused on a fitness tracker, um, very fo focused on the fitness space. So that's very important. They're targeted in their approach. Some weaknesses is they don't have as many points of differentiation as points of parity, for example. So, you know, their competition really has mainly the same features as them. So it's really this point of parity game. Whoever is advancing their technology, Fitbit just needs to keep working with the competition to stay on, on the same level and have that point of parity. Um, so that could be a weakness. You want to differentiate yourself. And then their marketing is less focused on the emotional side, a little bit more focused on the features as well. I think motion could be a great point of um, differentiation when your product is the same. If people look at it as the same, that emotional factor can actually be a differentiating factor that gets someone to buy your product over the competitor's product. And then some opportunities. Some opportunities would be to expand um, their segmentation. So target a new group of users, really expand that market, get that market penetration. 
refine their marketing strategy. So again, really appeal to that emotional side for that point of um, differentiation. And then lastly, they could potentially partner with businesses to have um, the business stakeholders wear those, wear those devices. And Ariel will talk about that in the upcoming slides. And then lastly, we have threats. So clearly Apple's a huge competitor. It's been stealing market share for years. And competition is getting better and better and better. There's more competition. They have better measurements. So it's really, again, that game of keeping up with the competition and making sure that you have those points of differentiation. And then so our recommendation. Our main recommendation is that Fitbit should really um, shift their segmentation, targeting, and then positioning to really focus on an older population. By older population, we mean 55 and plus. And I'll get you know into this a little bit more in the following slides. So Apple Watch target segments, right? So this is 2017 versus 2018. As you can see, their main targeting by age group was for the 35 to 44 years of age group, right, in 2017. On the right shows you 2018 that, as you can see, that's more spread throughout, you know, you have 19 to 24 grew 44 to 54 grew. So these segments grew. Now, if you look all the way to the right, 54 through 64 and 65 plus, that looks like an untapped market that Fitbit can really benefit some of those consumers. And we'll tell you how they're going to do that. So they can potentially have new target segments. So as we said, the 54 through 64 and then 65 plus. You have Nancy and you got Steve. Nancy, she's old, she's 78. She has COPD. So she has a pre-existing condition that she is looking to monitor. Um, she wants to prevent her sickness. She wants this health tracker to make sure she can track it and prevent any sicknesses that come her way. And then you have Steve, he's an accountant, he's obese. He really wants to get in shape and then he wants a device to improve his fitness and just monitor his heart rate, make sure that he doesn't have AFib or any other diseases that can come with being obese. I'm going to hand it off to Ariel to take you through the positioning statement. Hi, everyone. After deciding on targeting and segmentation, we developed the following positioning statement that we feel Fitbit should adopt. So the positioning statement is for adults over 55 years of age, Fitbit is a wearable device that delivers quality health monitoring capabilities so they can sustain their health because Fitbit provides accurate and reliable health data. And we feel that this really positions Fitbit as a device consumers can rely on to stay healthy and sustain their health. So after deciding on segmentation, targeting, positioning, Fitbit, we really feel they have to implement this in three different ways. And the first is te technological innovation, second, strategic partnerships, and then third, a promotional campaign. And I'm going to be diving into each of these on the next few slides. So from a technology lens, I just wanted to give kind of an overview of what health technology Fitbits currently have. And so you can see that the devices can track your breathing rate, tracks breathing rate, heart rate variability, skin temperature, oxygen saturation, and resting heart rate. So this is a these are a good amount of metrics that I think, you know, matter to consumers and it definitely shows you know, how you're doing in terms of health, um, as you can see on the right column, why all of these are important. Um, but I think Fitbit can definitely grow this list and really focus on improving their technology. So we recommend the following metrics that should be added at the bottom. You can see it would be great if there was fall detection, that would be really useful for the older segment. And then also blood sugar levels um, for people with diabetes, blood pressure and cholesterol, these are all really important metrics as you think about um, somebody's just general well-being as they get to, as they start aging. Okay, so the reason why we're recommending that Fitbit improve their health metrics um, tracking is because really of telehealth. So for those of you not familiar with telehealth, as we all know in 2020, uh, people have been on lockdown, right? And as a result of that, um, people are not seeking care and they're really afraid to physically go to the doctor because they don't want to get sick. So basically what happened was the telehealth industry really blew up last year. And as you can see in the chart, telehealth visits had really increased during COVID, but actually after COVID, they're still projected to be at higher levels than they, than they were previously. Okay, so here's, here's just a quick um, snapshot of the whole telehealth landscape. Right, as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of players here. And so really what we're trying to say with this slide is that 
we suggest that Fitbit does not work in a silo and just create their own health technology. They really have to um, work and partner with some of these companies in the broader telehealth industry to become more relevant to their consumers and um, older people, especially as you think about their health. So out of, out of all those organizations, we recommend Fitbit focus on three types of strategic partnerships. So the first is to really provide more product value in Fitbits. Fitbit should, should partner with telehealth and EHR companies. So I'll, I'll explain what both of those are. Um, telehealth companies, they provide the platform, um, as I was speaking to earlier, in which patients can communicate with their doctors and you know, have a virtual visit. And then an EHR stands for electronic health record. It's basically the doctor's computer system that stores patient health records and has information such as um, their test results and then other health data that Fitbit actually tracks using you know, their wearables. So if uh, by partnering with these companies, Fitbit can you know, integrate their data more and uh, really become the wearable of choice. And then as you can see on the right, I just wanna to touch on that. The, these partnerships will really ensure inter, interoperability between the health data that Fitbit is tracking and then you know, pushing that data to these platforms. Also, I think Fitbit can partner with these, these assisted living companies such as Genesis to really increase adoption from the older population. And then our, like, our last recommendation is for Fitbit to create a campaign that focuses on marketing to this older segment. This campaign should be more emotional and focus on appealing to like a, the emotions of consumer and how and why Fitbit has helped them. And this would really ultimately drive brand loyalty for Fitbit. And so as people become more and more connected, they're going to rely on it throughout their life. You know, if we're targeting people 55 and older, if they start wearing it when they're 50, they're going to be wearing it up until they're 80, especially if, if Fitbit positions themselves well as a health device. As part of this campaign, real people will be able to, will be encouraged to share their stories about their health and wellness. Maybe somebody has lost weight or maybe um, the Fitbit has helped somebody get through their diabetes or the campaign slogan uh, we think should be fitness matters, wellness wins. So um, we, we recommend Fitbit focus on um, deploying this campaign in the following channels, which are print, social, TV, and telehealth platforms. Yeah, so that's, that's the last piece of it. And basically, just to conclude, um, if Fitbit really focuses on, one, improving their technology, forming strategic partnerships, and then creating a campaign like this, a real, really emotional campaign, then we think this is going to bring success to Fitbit in the very credible wearable market.